Welcome to The Lawyer's Podcast, a series of conversations about law practice. Each week, we talk with legal entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. And now, here are your hosts. Hi, I'm Sam Glover. And I'm Aaron Street, and this is episode 194 of the Lawyerist podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. Today, we're talking with Lee Holcomb about how technology makes new career options available for women. Today's podcast is brought to you by LawPay, Smokeball, and New Law Business Model. We wouldn't be able to do this show without their support, so stay tuned, and we'll tell you more about them later on. So our team had a great time at the Clio Cloud Conference in New Orleans last week. One of the highlights that we all came away with was Kelly McGonagall keynote on how our thoughts about stress may have been misguided the whole time and that maybe some types of stress are actually good for us. Yeah, she laid a lot of blame on herself for counseling people that stress is bad for you because it is if you believe that and it isn't if you don't believe that in large part. Yeah, it was interesting that her talk was less around the kind of stress you carry and less yeah. around your coping mechanisms for it and almost entirely around your mindset around how you think about stress and how that's the trigger for whether stress is good for you or not. Yeah, we'll throw the link to her TED talk in the show notes, but what you won't get from that is some of her coping mechanisms which you could find in her in her book or and you can wait. I think Cleo will publish her keynote at some point, but I'm not positive about that. But it was interesting, really just stopping and reflecting on the fact that your stress is the way your body gets you ready to perform is enough to like open your blood vessels back up and change your body's response to stress. It was neat. And so basically, in a way, we've told you all you need to know, which is that stress is good for you. And as long as you believe that going forward, you're probably okay. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) I mean, it's interesting because for ever and ever, lawyers have talked about, oh, I'm stressed, or how can the profession deal with stress? And this is a really interesting spin on that that creates some different nuance than I think we've approached the topic with in the past. I'll admit I've been thinking about stress differently than most people for a while. The issue is first raised in my mind by Tim Ferriss in his overly hyped book, The 4-Hour Workweek, where he laid out some of the concepts of eustress versus distress. And there it's not a mindset difference, but it's the distinction between stress that causes you to rise to the occasion and chronic stress that beats you down and defeats you. And I think Mm, it's a similar concept. His wasn't around mindset, but maybe it's the same solution that there are things in our life that are hard and challenging. And then if we turn toward them is actually going to make us more successful. And there are other things in our life that are chronic and tough and beat us down that can be really challenging for us. Maybe it's all just a mindset shift to make it all better. The Tim Ferriss thing makes me think that there is a a really important difference between stress is something I'm accepting because this is a thing that I choose to do. And so obviously I'm my excitement, my anxiety, whatever around this challenge is going to be something that happens versus the perspective of stress is happening to me. It's beating me down and I'm experiencing it as a result of stuff that I, you know, like client demands, other stuff. I think it's the proactive versus reactive approach. Yeah. And I I think one concept that maybe ties both of these together earlier this year, we had Ryan Holiday on the podcast, his popular book is called The Obstacle is the Way. It's a book about stoic philosophy that we talked at length with him about. The concept of the title is when things are challenging, turn toward them. Those are the things to embrace, to make you stronger, to cause you to rise to the challenge, etc. Um, maybe I can close with something that I think Kelly McGonigal talked about, which was that you are anxious, you're stressed about things because you care about them. And so it turns out that in the countries with the highest self-reported levels of stress, there is also the highest reported happiness because you care about things and you can't be happy if there's if you don't care about anything in your life. And so stress is a source of happiness as well, indirectly, which is or a, a byproduct of happiness, which I think is nice. So I love that we're rethinking the common wisdom about stress, totally. um, especially because mental health and other challenges in our profession are real and we don't want to minimize them, but I think we need some new tools for addressing them. And, and I, think, them. I think some of this research is part of the answer to how we can move towards solving it. 
So now we've got a brief sponsored conversation with Josh Taylor from Smokeball, and then we'll jump into my conversation with Lee Holcomb on a totally different subject. Hi, I'm Josh Taylor, attorney and lead content strategist over at Smokeball Practice Management Software. I'm really thrilled to be with you today, Sam, to chat about document automation. Thanks for being back, Josh. And thanks again for uh, being a partner in the Lawyerist Affinity Program for our Insider and Lab members. That's really cool. Absolutely. We absolutely see the value in it. We know how many folks out there are getting their information from the lawyerist, and uh, we're happy to continue to be a next level partner with you guys. So today we're going to talk about document automation, which is obviously something that Smokeball does really well. But Josh, kind of why should we be thinking about this and what can it do for us? And, and how is it distinct from document assembly, which is another term that people might have heard? Yeah, absolutely, Sam. And it's interchangeably thrown around in the industry, I feel like, document assembly and automation. Uh, but those two buckets actually have their own unique traits. Assembly, something like you know a hot docs does, is more of choosing from sets of pre-written text options. So you can think of pre-written paragraphs, pre-written contractual terms um, that you're just going to pull into your document based on answers to questions usually. Um, automation varies a little bit from that because it's much more based on what the end user controlling the information going going into the document. So we also use with automation the word population, document population, where the end user is, you know, filling out prescribed fields in their practice management software, and those fields are then inserted into the document. You can also have contingencies wherein you can have variations of documents, can combine into one and populate as needed based on a set of facts or answers to questions. But it's still the end user's language with document automation. And what's the real advantage? Why should a firm really be thinking about automating its documents from top to bottom if it can? Yeah, absolutely. Number one is quality control. I mean, as attorneys, we're putting out a product and that's usually our written work. When you have quality control through document automation, you're consistently putting out the same product, no matter who on your team is in charge of it. If you're going to send a letter to a judge, it's going to be a consistent piece of work, whether your secretary is helping you with it, whether the associate did it or whether the partner did it. You can expect the same quality controlled work from anyone at the firm, from your firm. So if we're going to get started automating our documents, I know that can be an intimidating process to get your head <laughs> yes, around that. Yes. Like, what should we start automating? Yeah, absolutely. The, the starting point, Sam, is always going to be documents with minimal substantive changes, right? So you don't want to start automating a motion for summary judgment from scratch. Maybe, <laughs> <Right. laughs> maybe we start with something like a typical correspondence. What we see our clients come in the door with all the time is your engagement letter. That can have all the bells and whistles in it, um, price adjustments, names that need to be changed. But it's really a document that doesn't change substantially from client to client. So it's a really nice one to learn how to automate a document on. Other great ones are pour over wills, divorce petitions, some standard motions. I know we joked about a motion for summary judgment, but your standard motions will have a lot of the same context in them, the same uh, substance in them. And then standard correspondence and letters, uh, which you'll see in the family law toolkit that you can find in the program notes for the show. Very cool. And speaking of that family law toolkit, you can get that at smokeball.com slash family toolkit. We'll include the link in the show notes. There's some good stuff there, Josh. You've got standard correspondence for family lawyers, which is useful whether or not they use Smokeball. Right. Uh, you've got a white paper on hiring and managing staff, which is obviously useful whether or not they use Smokeball. Um, and then you have a white paper on using Smokeball specifically in a family law practice. So that's some cool stuff. Absolutely. And we're looking to put out these toolkits for many more practice areas, Sam. So we'd be excited to sort of have your audience check it out. Let us know what practice areas matter most to them. And we're going to be putting out several more of these. Sounds great. Thanks so much for being with us today, Josh. Of course, Sam. Always great to be with you. I'm Lee Holcomb. I am an attorney, but I've recently started down a career path as a speaker, consultant, and wellness coach for stressed out attorneys. Hi, Lee. Thanks for being with us today. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you got from where you were to where you are. 
you started out as a practicing lawyer and now you're doing something sort of adjacent but different. So maybe you could walk us through that path. Sure. I think I had a very traditional start with my legal career. I graduated from law school in 1998 and immediately went to work for an insurance defense attorney. I should point out that is in no way traditional for anyone who has graduated in the last like 10 years. <laughs> exactly. Right? Like, exactly. Everything but in changed. 1998, <laughs> you know, there were a couple of career paths and the most obvious was to go to work for an insurance defense firm. And I did that. And I felt like I got really, really lucky. I worked for 10 years with this firm, loved it, made partner in six years and was set completely ready to stay there for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And then something unexpected happened. My husband at the time decided he didn't want to work at that law firm anymore. <laughs> what he wanted to do was join the U.S. State Department. So we kind of had a, a very difficult decision, but as a lot of female attorneys have, it was also the time I was getting ready to want to have children. And so we decided in 2006 to leave our partnerships and move abroad. We moved to Warsaw, Poland, and I left my career. Hmm. And it was extremely difficult to be 35 years old and have worked so hard to get to the start of my career path and then have it completely pulled out from under me was, you know, it was trying. It was well, and being being in the State Department uh, as a spouse or my experience of it, because I was a Foreign Service brat was as the kid. It's just, it's not an easy thing to just pick up and move every few years to a completely new place full of strangers either. So stack that on top of all of your career stuff. Exactly. That's and that's, that's a good point that a lot of people don't realize because there's a romantic part about it that people see on, you know, the Internet and your posts. And, <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's also very um, you lose kind of that personal sense of who you are or who you think people think you are. <laughs> so after being posted to Warsaw, Poland for two years, I really wanted to get back to the practice of law. And I had read a little article about legal process outsourcing, literally like one paragraph. And so we decided to move to India because that's where it was happening. It was 2008 when we put in the bid and 2009 when we got to India. Hmm. Yeah, we moved to the south, to Chennai, and I fell into a position with a legal process outsourcing company doing large-scale e-discovery for U.S. companies. And so you were doing it for law firms in the U.S. or companies or both on, on I assume, big document-intensive litigation projects? Well, the goal was to be doing it for either, but at the start of the legal process industry, it really was mainly corporations that were driving the jobs because the law firms were still really holding on to that work. The more forward-thinking law firms had their own onshore teams of attorneys that were separate from their offices being billed out at a lower rate, but they weren't yet willing to drive the work to India. So all of our clients were U.S. companies at that time. And you're, so you rose through the ranks of that company and, and then now you've graduated and you're doing other things is what I, my understanding. Exactly. So yeah. I stayed on the ground for two years with the team uh, doing training, working on projects. And then my husband's job with the State Department took us to Paraguay and I stayed on with the company and kind of transferred my job responsibilities into client development, client management on the U.S. side, and I eventually became the COO of that company. It's interesting looking, thinking about that now because, like, I remember, you know, outsourcing when outsourcing was the big boogeyman of the legal industry, right, where, you know, we're sending all this work to India and, and you want to outsource to teams of document reviewers in India instead of paying higher rates here in the U.S., and we're kind of moving towards the finishing stages of the next phase, which is bringing it back here and plugging it into computers instead of having humans do it, which is kind of fascinating to think about that in such a short amount of time, we've gone through those different stages of this whole thing. Yeah, I think you're spot on there. I think that in the next five, probably five years, I was going to say five to 10, but I think it'll be even shorter than that. We say five to 10 about everything. And so <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I personally want to stop saying five to 10 years about stuff because I feel like it just is always five to 10 years. Exactly. So just find new things to fit into that. <laughs> exactly. But I, I think that you're right. You're going to see a big pullback from offshoring, as I call it, to keeping it more onshore. One, because the U.S. attorney prices have come down. And two, because as technology continues to become more refined and U.S. attorneys become more educated on how to use it, 
there's going to be less incentive to push it offshore because you're going to have the people in the U.S. that are close to you that are well trained on what your end goal is for the case. And they're going to know how to use the technology on top of it. So maybe this is not an interesting thing to anyone, um, but I think it's worth, I think it is interesting and I think it's worth touching on again. Um, and, and maybe everybody's heard it, I guess, is what I meant to say. But really, how do you get from thinking about your career path to, in general, like what is different about career paths for women lawyers from men lawyers? And like, how does that affect your thinking about what the future looks like and what the rest of our conversation might take the shape of? Well, I think that's a good question. And I think I have a little bit of a potentially unique perspective, predominantly out of luck, because Mm -hmm. I feel like I had a traditional career path and I feel like I had several traditional female career challenges come up. I wanted to have children. I didn't have the outside support to for me to be a partner in a law firm and have two children, I thought was going to be too much. And then I, at the same time, was being asked by my spouse to leave my position and, and follow his career. I think I just barely got there where the changes in technology and legal innovation was just far enough along that I was able to kind of salvage my career and stay on my career path rather than leaving my chosen profession. And so I think that Even more so now, as you pointed out, technology's really changed the practice of law. There's new legal operations innovations. I think that opens up the ability for female lawyers to stay more engaged in the practice of law, to have more opportunities when they're caring for children or other family members than they've ever had before. So I I really think it's kind of a sweet spot for female attorneys. Now, part of that does involve a change in your mindset you may not be able to be a partner in a law firm in all instances and stay on a really aggressive career path. But I think it is opening up a lot more job opportunities for women that are willing to use technology and kind of think about their practice in a little different way. I mean, I like your perspective because I feel like often we talk about, you know, women face challenges in careers because um, you have this this unfair choice of do you want to start a family or have a career, and and everybody goes yup that's a problem, yeah and then that's kind of it like, <laughs> you know so what I appreciate about you know sk- skimming your book and um, and talking about this from your perspective is that well no like you can have a career and have children or or whatever it is you want out of life as long as you are willing to sort of step back from the uh, the traditional ideas of what law practice ought to be, which everyone in the profession ought to be doing right now anyway. Exactly. <laughs> everyone should be rethinking it because traditional law practice has made us suicidal and depressed alcoholics who abuse substances and get divorced all the time. Traditional law practice is nothing to, to write home about, so we should all be rethinking a bit. And here, look, like technology has created all of these new jobs. Let's start thinking about it. Yeah, and, you know, that's a really important point point, Sam, I actually had a classmate that passed away this past week. And it really makes you think hard about the choices you're making. And I I don't think it's a male female choice. But and I I struggle with that in my book, because I went back and forth. Am I writing this for everyone? Or am I writing it for females? And I do think it applies to both. But we do all need to be thinking about what's really important in life and how to do things differently. And And there are some people that both male and female that are very well cut out to be the high level partners, the big trial attorneys that are handling the big cases. Well, and if we solve this problem for women, we are going to solve it for anyone else who might fit into that similar, you know, need for different choices in how they practice law. So I'm I'm not bothered by the fact that it's focused on women. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Not not that I ought to be. Yeah, but (laughs) I, I, I think that the attorneys that are willing to think about the practice of law differently and are willing to learn how to use technology and really kind of plug it into their legal practice, if you will, are going to be the ones that come out ahead. This feels like an okay place to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors, because when we come back, I really want to dive into the meat of this. What is it about technology that has changed and and what are some of the effects? What are some of the jobs it's created and what kind of expectations can people bring to the practice of law now that were not practical 10 or 15 years ago? We'll be right back. Smokeball practice management software exists to streamline small law firms and reduce the stress of running a small business. With Smokeball, your firm is much more organized, productive, and profitable, meaning you and your staff can breathe easy with less stress. Visit smokeball.com lawyers today to learn more and book a demo. Like what you see? 
Lawyers podcast listeners are eligible for 50% off onboarding. With Smokeball at your firm, it's less stress and more success. If you're not 100% happy with your law practice right now, chances are you want more. More income from your practice, more fulfillment from your work, and more freedom to enjoy your life. There's a new law business model that is allowing passionate attorneys to reclaim their lives and love practicing law again. Alexis Neely has been training lawyers for over a decade on the new law business model she created to build her own million dollar law practice. And now the lawyers she has trained in that new law business model have their own high six and seven figure law practices, all without sacrificing time with their families and only working with clients they love to serve. It is possible to experience the exhilaration of a thriving law practice, do the most meaningful legal work, have a real impact in your clients' lives, and have complete control over your schedule. Discover this new law business model now by watching the free video workshop series at newlawbusinessmodel.com slash lawyerist. Did you know that attorneys who accept online payments get paid 39% faster on average than those who use traditional payment methods? With LawPay, the only payment solution offered through the ABA Advantage program You can easily accept client payments online, via email, or in person. No equipment needed. Visit lawpay.com slash lawyerist to sign up and get your first three months free. Trust the only payment solution developed for attorneys and recommended by 48 state bars. LawPay. Okay, Lee, so we've teed this up, and now I'd like to ask you to really break this down for us. Like, How has technology changed in ways that have created new jobs? And maybe we can cover some examples of what sorts of jobs are available today and and how those fit into the practice of law differently than they would have before. Sure. I guess where I'd like to start is, you know, the belief that technology is going to replace all lawyers. (laughs) I I don't think that's happening. We love talking about (laughs) robots on this show, though. (laughs) Right, right. But I do think that if we can rethink about technology and see it as a tool to help us, like technology is a really good paralegal. Mm -hmm. They're going to, it's going to be able to do some of the heavy lifting for you. And it's going to take some of the work off your plate, learning how to use it and thinking if I can learn how to use it and cut back on my billable hours, then my client's going to be happier. I'm going to be able to build more time on the heavier work. I think you're going to find a a win-win for you and your client, learning how to use AI, learning how to use platforms like Ross Intelligence or Kira for contracts. If you can be at the forefront of incorporating these tools into your practice, I think that is definitely one way that's going to help make you more secure in your job and open up new job opportunities for you. I mean, I think think we can dispense with the whole robots are going to take our jobs argument by just thinking about smoke detectors, Um, right? Smoke detectors are a very simple algorithm. If smoke triggers this little switch in the machine, it starts beeping like mad. And if you have that plugged into a home, you know, alarm protection system, it's going to call up the fire department and they're going to show up whether or not, you know, you burned your cereal or there's an actual fire in your house. Automation automates the same things no matter what. And, and it needs a human sitting there to decide, is this real or not? And um, or is this correct or not. You know, when I talk to the predictive coding companies uh, who, who do the e-discovery review, they say, yeah, it's cut down by, say, two thirds the number of lawyers who need to be involved in this. But you still need a core group of lawyers supervising the algorithms that are predictively coding the documents. It doesn't get rid of all the jobs. It just changes the nature of them. Exactly. But, you know, smoke detectors. <laughs> <laughs> right. I like I like that example that I just came up with. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. So yeah, I think that's a a couple of the ways to think about it. Keeping yourself up to date now on technology is is also a component of the the job. You know, the ABA model rules 1.1 comment 8 have now placed a, a requirement that attorneys practicing law today Oh, I have, have a whole soapbox able... about that. It is not a new requirement, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it is a new note, but it is not a new requirement. But let's talk, so let's talk about some of the jobs that you would say are sort of emblematic of what you're talking about here. E-discovery, I think is, you know, was the first example. I think you're seeing legal operations jobs opening up. So a lot of companies that I've worked with in the past couple of years have gone from using outsourcing for e-discovery and contract review to now start bringing in attorneys to look at both their legal and business operations to see what work can be, low-level work can be taken off and given to outside resources outside of a law firm or their in-house counsel. 
so I think that will continue to, to happen. I think we're in the infancy of that type of development because they're really trying to look at attorney managed services and what all can be more efficiently done outside of their core group of in-house attorneys and using what I call subject matter experts, ones that have become highly trained in these technologies that are advancing with AI, the legal research platforms, the e-discovery, the contract platforms, and they're using those to come into legal operations and help improve the workflow. I guess that that brings up a, a question for me. How how much of the way technology is changing the career, you know, the, the job market is happening at the level of big corporations and big law firms? Like when we talk about e-discovery, that's fundamentally uninteresting for most of our <laughs> listenership because we're in solo and small firm practice where e-discovery is a thing for a sliver of those practices. Like how much of this is really tied to big firms and big corporations? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it is tied to big firms and big corporations, but I think you'll see a continued trickle down that that's offering certain smaller solo practitioners new career paths at a time when they may need it. And then you'll just still have, you know, divorce attorneys, plaintiff's attorneys are still going to be needed. But I, I think we're starting to see a trend where there's more need for new employment options. And so when you look at job listings on true staffing that are talking about privacy attorneys, cybersecurity attorneys, e-discovery attorneys again, <laughs> or you're looking at new staffing models like Council on Call, Axiom, Elevate. I think that's where if you're not happy in your current position, although some of this may sound foreign to you, there's new ways to look at new job opportunities. So there's other job opportunities out there. And that's part of the point of my book is to educate attorneys that may not be used to the world that I'm talking about. So we, we've touched on e-discovery. What's maybe another example that we could think about? You know, I think we're going to continue to see this in cybersecurity. I took a course last year with Harvard X, which was an online course, kind of training people that aren't IT experts. Well, it was really a cross-training course. So either for attorneys or people that didn't have enough technology training or for technologists that didn't have enough attorney training. So kind of trying to blend the two worlds and seeing what you need to know to be able to report to boards, to be able to advise your clients on cybersecurity tools and techniques. It was really, for me, kind of a, a crucial course that helps me feel more comfortable that I do understand what's going on. So I, I think you'll continue to see a development in the cybersecurity world where attorneys are trying to figure out how they can be more useful how they can fill the void and the gap because there is such a need right now for filling these positions. I, you know, I forget the exact numbers, but there's projected millions of <laughs> un, unfilled cybersecurity positions in the next hmm. five years or so. And, and so uh, that would be, uh, you'd be working for a cybersecurity firm providing advice to corporations then? Well, I think that's that's one route. You could be doing that. You could be working on cybersecurity insurance policies, either vetting vendors or helping to set up the rules and regulations for the policies. Or you could be looking at DPO positions within corporations. You know, the GDPR has come out requiring data privacy officers that have a blend of the legal background and the technology background. So that's opening up positions for attorneys that do have that technology experience. California has new privacy laws coming into effect in a couple of years. I think that's going to open up more positions. But again, you're going to have to be willing to take on some additional training for most lawyers well, um, I mean, because you're going to have to. Yeah, I mean, most lawyers fall somewhere on the spectrum from apathetic to hostile <laughs> when it comes to technology. And so I'm wondering, like, when you think about that, how do you go from being a lawyer who is um, somewhere between bewildered and angry about technology to someone who's competent to talk about data security, cybersecurity risks and benefits and evaluate that kind of a thing? Where do you go to learn about that? Well, I think there's a lot of options. I mean, there's there's free webinars all the time to kind of get your feet wet. I joined um, the Idaho Technology Council Last year, I go to meetings every month in my local community with technology experts, and I just I get comfortable trying to hear the lingo, trying to understand the lingo. I ask questions. It, they're surprisingly receptive because there's only two attorneys 
in Boise, Idaho that go to these conferences mm -hmm. and I'm yeah. one of them. <laughs> um, it's which an is easy kind way of to distinguish yourself. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a lot of tools out there. There's online courses with FEMA, for example, puts together this course through the Texas A&M Engineering Extension Service. And these are online classes. Most of them are free. And they talk a lot about essentials of community cybersecurity. They lay out the basics of cybersecurity for you. And you can do that, you know, an hour here, an hour there. And it really gives you that kind of extra comfort level that you're on the right track, that you're starting to feel more competent. And it, it opens up new doors. Hmm. So cybersecurity consulting, evaluation, whatever. Um, we've talked about e-discovery. Do uh, you have another example? Privacy law. SIP US, SIP EU, SIP M certifications through the International Association of Privacy Professionals. That's an, another online and in-person training that can provide you more credentials to make you more valuable in your current position at your firm or open up new job opportunities. It would help to get an idea of um, what kind of salaries or compensation do you think someone can expect who, let's say they were in the same position you were um, when you decided to pick up and move to Poland, um, and you're trying to, maybe you take a year or so off to have with the new baby, and, and then you decide to dive back in. What kind of salaries do you think you can expect to earn, or is it just all over the map as you're, as you're sort of trying to be a part-time legal process outsourcer and a part-time parent? <laughs> it is all over the map, and that's mm -hmm. um, kind of some of the details that I go into in the second part of my book. I break down the different, some of the different career options, whether you're staying on a law firm path, a corporate path, an e-discovery path, a cybersecurity path. It really kind of depends. So one job option to stay in the practice of law when you're on maternity leave or you're dealing with a family member that needs extra care and you really just can't commute to work every day and do a, a 40 plus hour a week job is to go on board on a contract basis for a staffing organization in e-discovery contract work or secondment work. And, you know, I think you can, depending on the area of the country, it could be as low as $30, $35 an hour, or you could, depending on your expertise and background, get higher up into the $70, $80, $90 range if you're in the, the project management area. But what it does allow is for you to stay in. So it's, for me, a much better option than taking eight years off and then trying to come back in, you're still going to have challenges. So is, is the yourself. way to think about this as a sort of, it is a second family income opportunity and it's a way to keep your skills fresh in case you want to dive back into the, the general, you know, traditional law firm workforce at some point. Yeah, I think that's definitely one one way to think about it. There's also some, and I don't have personal experience, but there are some more, I would call them forward thinking firms that are doing uh, remote jobs for attorneys. I know Littler has a program where you're not on the partnership track. You are a, a full-time employee with them. You can work remotely from your home and you just have a more specific, narrowed daily job description. That's, I think the flip side of this is, you know, if you're an employer, if you have a small firm or a big firm, how can you take advantage of highly skilled lawyers who need flexibility in their workspace? Um, this is something Aaron and I at Lawyerist have decided to incorporate in the way we do things, but it's also something we talk to other people about because like a woman lawyer who is taking time off to raise a child is still a highly skilled professional who just has some restraints on what she is willing and able to do with her time and attention. And like, that feels like a, a really massively untapped resource out there that if you can get your head away from, I need people to work 80 hours a week and be in my office where they sleep all the time, if you can get away from that twisted mindset, there's just a huge amount of untapped potential out there for jobs that you could, you could offer. I, I would love to see more of that because I think there's such potential there to you know erase some of the um, some of that whole dilemma of having to choose between a career and a family that is really unfair and, and I think unnecessary if you just change the way you think about jobs. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think Littler's program's fantastic. I hope to see more law firms doing that. There may already be 
more law firms doing that, and I just don't know about it. You know, I said earlier, I think Axiom, Elevate, Council on Call all provide a similar type of job opportunities for women that are, or men that are, you know, wanting to change how they practice for whatever reason. You know, some of it is just, I think certain certain people need to feel even more so that they're providing for their employer what they say they're going to provide. And so they would rather take on a, a different categorized job that has less requirements, both, you know, whether it be f- being physically in the office or certain job descriptions, they're just more comfortable and they're willing to take less money and they're willing to have less job security and to feel that they're meeting their employer's expectations. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. But I kind of wonder when I hear about some of these structures, like I totally get that putting in less time should make you less money, but I wonder why the rate ought to be lower. Like, you know, if you're, if you've been a lawyer for seven years and you decide to um, reduce your time commitment to 10 or 20 hours a week, I get that you should only be paid for 10 to 20 hours a week instead of 60 or 80, but why would your effective hourly rate for that time be lower? I I don't think necessarily that your rate should be lower. And so when you were asking earlier, I was thinking of some of the more obvious options are to be an independent contractor doing a discovery work. Mm -hmm. Those rates have really gone down. Yeah. You know, especially it's different. Then, then you're doing different work. You're changing the kind of work you do. You're exactly. (laughs) So ton of sense. Yeah, like apples to apples, if you've always been doing employment law and you've reached a certain level of expertise, yes, there should be and there are certain ways that you're going to be able to fill that void and maintain a same or similar hourly rate, definitely. When someone is trying to figure this out, like what is the right fit for me? How should I take advantage of the new jobs that are available to me, given the market I'm in, the skills I have? How should they start thinking about this? That's a good question. You know, I think that depends on each person and their personality, their their goals, where they are on their career path. And I think it's going to change over the course of each individual's career. So I think, you know, as you age and mature and things change in your life, the answer to the question you just asked is potentially going to be very different. But I think it's important to take some time to reflect and really look at what parts of your career you enjoy what parts you're good at, and kind of try to rethink how how you can fit the special components of your career and your expertise into your job better mm-hmm. to make yourself happier. And I think you're going to end up with a better product for your yourself, your client, your employer. So some introspection. And then I like to take some time looking at a different type of job opportunities and what the qualifications are and kind of try to think outside the box a little bit every now and then, like, huh, I think I could do that. Or that's something I hadn't thought of before, but, you know, I'm going to go and, and take the SIP US exam, hopefully pass that exam, and then I'm going to have more qualifications. I'm going to have more confidence in myself and, and open up new doors for my career. I think, uh, I, you know, I've, I've known people who have left the traditional law practice path and I think one of the biggest obstacles, which you talk about in your book, and and we've talked about a bit, is sort of the psychological shift of getting away from your preconceived notions of what law practice is and accepting that you can do something different and it will still be good and valid and you will still be contributing to society and doing important work that justifies your education and all that stuff. I mean, that's it, it's sort of a tectonic shift that you need to make in your mind before you can do this, I think, for a lot of people at least. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And it's just that and... For me, it was also learning that these other parts of my life that I never thought of as, quote unquote, Mm attorney-like. So I was a studio art major. I always kind of kept that separate. It wasn't like I was ashamed of it, but it just didn't fit into the image of being an attorney. And I've really tried um, now to embrace that more and talk about that more frequently because that's really part of why I went to law school was I was selling artwork and I had a lady come to me and she said, you know, let's let's take this globally. Let's get it made in Mexico and bring it back to the U.S. and sell it. And I was so freaked out by that. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) I read that part of your book and I was like, wow, like, okay, I need to be able to understand contracts. So I'm going to law school. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that's an amazing decision. (laughs) Right. And, you know, so but it is hard, you know, because we all have these preconceived ideas about so many things. And it's really important to realize that 
you need to find something that you can, that fits all parts of you. Mm -hmm. And whether that's having children or being an artist shouldn't be excluded from your, your day to day practice. Well, traditional law practice is a box, right? And where everybody who goes to law school tries to fit themselves into that box. And there are a couple different sizes, you know, you can go big law or small, you can go in house or, or public interest, but there's just a few boxes and everybody's trying to fit themselves into it. What you're really talking about is designing your own box. Exactly. I like that. And, and I think the new generation, the millennials are already on that path. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah. So I think you're going to see a whole new revelation from the practice of law, from technology, the new millennials coming out. I think that's going to be much more common. And I think that this box thinking, as you described it, is going to go I think we could all do a better job of refusing to accept the status quo if it doesn't work for us. So Exactly. Lee's book is going to be out by the time this podcast is out, so we will include a link to it in the show notes. Lee, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Make sure to catch next week's episode of The Lawyerist Podcast by subscribing to the show in your favorite podcast app. And please leave a rating to help other people find our show. You can find the notes for today's episode on lawyerist.com slash podcast. The Lawyerist Podcast is produced with help from Lindsay Calhoun and edited by Paul Fisher. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not endorsed by Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you. 